Alright, thank god. Neon Genesis Evangelion is a series I hold very close to my heart. I mean, come on, we've all heard the story by now. The story of a boy named Shinji living in the city of New Orleans where his father Gendo helped build him a robot for his birthday to save the world from aliens. You know that show. Sega Genesis, even flow. Not only is it one of my favorite all-time anime shows, but it's one of my favorite all-time pieces of storytelling in any medium. And being an artsy-fartsy student, I fall on the camp of Evangelion as a masterpiece, and while I do understand that there's many valid faults and criticisms against the show, I know it's not a show for everyone, but I will stand my ground and say it's a show that everyone should watch at least once. As series creator Hideaki Anno stated, Evangelion is like a puzzle. Any person can see it and give his or her own answer. In other words, we're offering viewers to think for themselves so that each person can imagine his or her own world, leaving the show open to interpretation to the viewer. And boy, do I have those interpretations. Evangelion is an otherworldly franchise, especially in Japan. There's a YouTube video by Red Bard that proves that you can live off literally nothing but Evangelion merchandise. With a successful franchise like Evangelion that at its core is about the narrative of its main cast and not the flashy angels and robots, it was bound to have varying degrees of spin-offs and convoluted extended backstory. I got my hands on some of the absurd Evangelion manga spin-offs and I figured I'd talk about them because I don't see anyone else mentioning the fact that Shinji kills an angel with a goddamn Glock in any of the countless YouTube video essays so someone has to because I have been able to sleep since. Before I get started, I do want to say that I'll be spoiling all of the manga I will be talking about in this video, or the first volumes at least. If at any point you want to experience these for yourself, you can skip along with the timestamps in the description, or however the hell YouTube wants to display it. Also, since all of the manga I'll be talking about in this video is mostly out of print, I wasn't able to find scans for any of them, so I had to tediously take a picture of each page just so you could follow along with me. I know it's shoddy, but I'm trying my best here. With that out of the way, Let's get started. Let's start off as vanilla as we can get, the official Neon Genesis Evangelion manga adaptation. This adaptation is interesting because it began releasing almost a full year before the anime began airing. Also, I would like to point out that the end of Evangelion was released in July 1997. The manga had its last chapter published in June of 2013. God damn, that's some dedication. The author, Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, could have very easily just stopped after the initial hype of Eva died down, but he stayed dedicated and finished it at his own pace, of course. So, how does the manga itself hold up after all these years? It holds up pretty damn well. It is also the only manga series in this video that I sought all the volumes out for. And in my personal opinion, I think it's better than the anime. Okay, hear me out. The manga follows the plot of the original 26 episodes of Evangelion all the way through to the end of Evangelion. The manga follows the majority of the series' main plot points. Shinji gets in the robot, hates his father, Shinji gets a little too close to a girl, Shinji proceeds to hate his father, Shinji gets in the robot, rinse and repeat. However, the manga puts a unique spin on most of the scenes and gives all the characters so much more depth. This in turn makes the series so much more approachable to newcomers to the series. You don't have to watch 8 hours of YouTube video essays to understand why Shinji has cum on his hand. All the characters are way more expressive and state their goals and their problems outright to the reader. There is no introspection episode here. All the characters feel so much more lively. Shinji is far less introverted and is so much more expressive than he was in the anime. Sure, Shinji is still plagued by self-doubt and hatred for his father, but at least he's able to show emotion and express those to other characters and isn't always stuck in his own shell. Rei is one of my least favorite characters in the anime, but in the manga, I actually became really interested in her character. Rei has more dialogue in the manga than in the entirety of the original series, and by the end, I actually began to feel very sympathetic for not just her, but fucking Gendo also. As I mentioned before, the manga still hits all the same story beats the anime created while changing them slightly, either for the sake of character development or just so that the story makes more fucking sense. I'm not going to spoil too much, but a couple of examples are. In episode 4 of the anime, Shinji decides to resign from Nerve because he can't handle being a pilot for the Eva. This results in Nerve sending Shinji back to live with his aunt and uncle. However, Shinji never gets on the train and Masato tries to make it there in time to convince Shinji to come back. In the anime, they just stare at each other for about two minutes until Shinji decides to come back. In the manga, Masato brings Pen Pen and tells Shinji that like Pen Pen, she didn't take them into her home out of pity, but desperately wanted to have a family of her own, which is touching and much needed character development. Another example is the first time we meet Asuka. Instead of a proper introduction on the boat where Toji says hello by showing Asuka his cock, they come across Asuka at an arcade on the way home from school. We get introduced to her hot-headed personality and then she proceeds to beat up a bunch of thugs like twice her size over an arcade game and later Masato is like, oh yeah, that's Asuka by the way. Not only in the manga do we get a proper introduction to Asuka's personality before we know who she is, but we don't have to see Toji's cock in the process. I think that the manga adaptation of Neon Genesis Evangelion is an amazing companion piece to the original anime series, 
and is an absolute must read if you're a fan of the franchise. I would recommend watching the anime first before reading the manga because it'll just make you appreciate all the changes they made that much more. The manga is really easy to follow and clears up so many of the vague aspects the original anime had. Feeling a light to decent 10 on this one. However, the rest of the material we're going to cover in this video definitely strayed far from the path the original anime laid out. And before we get into more fan service type ass shit, Let's talk about Neon Genesis Evangelion Anima, because the anime just wasn't enough. Ew, no, I'm sorry, I just can't. Next up is Neon Genesis Evangelion Angelic Days by Fumino Hayashi. There was a total of six volumes published from November 2003 to December 2005, but today we're going to be looking at the first volume. This manga in particular is based off a PS2 light novel called Neon Genesis Evangelion Girlfriend of Steel Second, or as the cover is subtitled, Iron Maiden Second. Huh. Is that technically a Jethro Tull reference? Asuka has brown hair and Rei is blushing and I'm very concerned for my well-being here. Imagine A implying a single, Neon Genesis Evangelion in which dating the right girl is more important than saving the world. Uh oh, putting a lot of faith in Shinji here, he already isn't much of a ladies man to begin with. This could go horribly wrong, and by that I mean it sounds like a porn plot. If anything, this tagline has me more concerned for what a Neon Genesis Evangelion even is. After writing this video, I still don't know. Wait a minute. The standard assortment of high school goofballs. I mean, if it has goofballs in it, then it's okay. I mean, I I'm already sold. You remember in episode 26 of Evangelion where Shinji realizes that without other people, he can't perceive himself as an individual and form his own identity? And as an example, the episode shows us an alternate reality where Shinji has a pretty typical normal middle school life and everything is happy-go-lucky for Shinji and friends. And as a result, Shinji decides to continue to not only to reject human instrumentality, but realizes he can still hate parts of himself, but still value himself as an individual. Well, what if we made an actual storyline based on an alternate reality where everything is happy-go-lucky for Shinji and friends with no pee-pee-poo-poo, I'm lonely? No joke, this is the exact alternate reality from the show. They even reference the toast Ray has in her mouth. But that's a trope at this point, so I could be wrong. Hell, most of the first chapter of this first volume parallels that scene from the show. The first chapter starts off with Asuka waking up Shinji. Shinji oversleeps and both of them dart off to class. As they are running past, they both mention big changes in the city. In the anime, they mention population, while in the manga, they mention the buildings. Ray bumps into Shinji while eating toast and accuses him of seeing pantaloons. Masato is also the teacher of the kiddo's class, and when Ray is introduced as a new student, she further accuses Shinji of being on a panty raid, while Asuka stands up for him in the most tsundere way possible. However, unlike the little 5 minutes of screen time the scene has in the anime, the manga elaborates further and changes enough details to where it can build its own story in this alternate universe. Asuka is super protective of Shinji like holy shit she has this boy pinned, but never actually admits her feelings to him to their fullest, even when it's needed the most. Kaoru is an actual student with the rest of the cast and proves to be a rival to Asuka in teenage romance terms that is. Shinji is a happy-go-lucky character in this story where he's friends with everyone and nothing really seems to phase him, even when he gets a huge pot of boiling water thrown at him. Good for him, he's taking care of himself. Moving on, Shinji yawns and everyone blows a casket for some reason. Shinji explains that he had a weird dream last night where he saw an Evangelion-like figure. Kairu just low-key name drops Adam was the light Shinji saw in his dream and brushes it off like it was nothing. Masato tells Shinji that after class he should go to the nurse's office and this is where Nerve butts its head into the story. Shinji goes to see Ritsuko, the school nurse, who is also the school nurse in Campus Apocalypse for some reason, but trust me, we'll get to that in a second. And Ritsuko mentions that Shinji needs to partake in a physical exam for Nerve. Ritsuko also flat out tells his 14 year old that she has the hots for his father, which is just creepy, what's wrong with you people? We find out that Asuka and Shinji's parents both work for Nerve, and Nerve is recruiting children for some unknown readiness exam. All the kids that happen to do well in the readiness exam are, who would have guessed, all of Shinji's friends and Rei who just got here. All the children are to report to Nerve after school and after some banter between Rei and Asuka fighting over Shinji, Shinji and Rei arrive at Nerve first. We get a glimpse at some funky looking Gendo where Shinji expresses that he doesn't have a liking for his father and never sees him. Alternate realities really can't change that, huh, Shinji? This is when Rei mentions that she doesn't have parents and lives alone. Well, what the fuck did she do, turn them all into soup? This gets the reader thinking that there is something more to her character that we don't know. Moving on, the reader finds out that Nerve is testing candidates to be pilots of some unknown vehicle as the story alludes to. Wonder what that could be. Masato points out that it is weird that all of the candidates are students from her class and Kaoru has the highest sync ratio, which raises concern. After the test is over, the students are told to report back to Nerve on a regular basis, but still aren't told specifically what the tests are for. Asuka is still heated at Shinji for going to Nerve without her and makes Shinji buy her some nuggies. 
After Asuka has done nuggies, Shinji calls Asuka fat and Asuka calls Shinji a little bitch boy because he can't touch Rim. Some more teenage romance banter ensues and we finally learn how Asuka and Rei were able to cook for Shinji and Ava 2.0. In fourth period home economics of course. Asuka is still mad at Shinji for talking to Rei, Shinji drops a misogynistic joke in the chat and helps Rei cook. Asuka accidentally drops some, and by some, I mean an entirely pot of boiling hot water on Shinji. The two of them make up like three pages later, so the third degree burns really aren't that much of an issue to him. Later on, there's a conversation between Rei and Masato that raises more suspicion about who or what Rei is, and that she hasn't had much interaction with people her age. Moving on to the last chapter, the volume gives us a chance to see some more character development. Like the anime, we see Toji have a thing for the class president and Kaji is still close to Ritsuko and Masato. Kaji does a background check on Karu and notes that it's suspicious that his record is nearly wiped clean with no one really remembering his existence. Asuka is still attracted to Kaji, nothing new there. Rei later on loses her school bag. Asuka finds out that some bullies are trashing Rei's stuff for Asuka, and Asuka kicks their ass and stands up for Rei in some interesting character development. Rei also mentions that she didn't bother buying the school uniform because she might transfer soon, which makes her character even more mysterious. Asuka walks with Rei home, and it's revealed that both Asuka and Rei have deep feelings for Shinji, and like in the anime, Asuka still fears being alone. Overall, I actually thought this volume was really good, all things considered. I know this is the first volume and isn't going to tell the reader everything, but it told me enough to keep me invested and actually left me wanting to seek out the rest of the volumes. I didn't think that I would like the junior high rom-com type scenes, but I was actually really interested to see how these interpretations of the characters interacted with one another. For starters, Shinji isn't a whiny bitch in this one. I like how the plot deals with Nerve and Kaoru. They give you bits and pieces of something sinister yet to come, but mask it with such a light-hearted teenage romance that I feel as if a twist were to come up later on, it would hit hard. I feel like this is what people who didn't like the way how the Evangelion anime shifted after episode 16 might like, and I say might with an asterisk because it's debatable whether you care more about character romance than the robots. Based solely on reading this first volume, I feel like I could recommend this one to anyone who is a fan of the series to at least try out. It's harmless and inoffensive to Evangelion as a spin-off and carries its story with confidence. The next crime against humanity is Neon Genesis Evangelion Campus Apocalypse. It was written by Ming Ming and consists of four volumes. I also want to mention that the Wikipedia page states that, though the series uses the same characters, the story, and the setting, it does differ from the Neon Genesis Evangelion manga. Shinji has a fucking gun! Things are already off to a great start when we get a nice glimpse of Shinji double-cheeked up on a Wednesday afternoon. It's when Shinji finds a weird-looking gobstopper in the vending machine and we cut to the next day. It is introduced to us that Shinji lives with Kaji and goes to Nerve Academy. At the Academy, Kensuke and Toji are still Shinji's friends in this universe. Kensuke reveals that there's a conspiracy involving the Magi, which is just a dark web looking ass website in this universe, that the apocalypse is going to happen this year and the world is going to end. Nothing like some good old Y2K in my Evangelion, am I right? Kaoru is revealed to be the new student in class and asks Shinji to show him around the school. Things get a bit yaoi between the two, and after we watch Shinji stalk both Kaoru and Rei on their way home from school, Shinji watches Rei kill a bird with the Sphere of Longinus. With what I just set aside, why does Rei have the Sphere? I figured of all people this would be Asuka's weapon of choice. Moving on, the mystical gobstopper that Shinji found in the vending machine the other day explodes. Not only do we find out that the pigeon Rei stabbed is not only an angel with a human form, but of all angels, it's fucking Ramiel. I busted out laughing when I witnessed this. You mean to tell me that this menacing angel is supposed to be this guy? Trust me, it gets even better. It turns out that the angels are after the orbs like the one Shinji has, and this guy really has the audacity to go up to Shinji and say, You gonna give it back or what? I'm fucking crying. Kaoru mentions that the angels want to bring down the pillars of heaven or some shit, and the angels need the jawbreakers like the one Shinji has to stop it. God, for the first time in Evangelion is starting to get a bit evangelical. Ramiel begins attacking Shinji and friends, and a straight up shonen fight scene ensues. Right hand Kun makes his debut, and Shinji gets fucking blasted and dies. Things would have been okay if he'd just gotten the goddamn robot. Shinji wakes up from his nappy poo, and we see that Ritsuko is also here, playing the role of the school nurse. Rei takes Shinji to a literal church that happens to be on campus, and leads him down to the Mermelair. Shinji finds himself in the depths of the Mermelair with Asuka, Karu, and Rei, where a Zordon-like ominous voice, I'm assuming from the heavens, tells Shinji that he has no choice but to accept the mission to become a Shimazai, like the others in the room, and fight angels. The ominous voice tells Shinji that his G Fuel Shaker is his Ava and fuses its powers to his DNA. Kaoru explains that Shinji's Ava, or the weapon he will use to fight, is a manifestation of his will. What is that weapon that is a physical representation of Shinji's will? 
Shinji's holding a gun on the next page. Kairu goes on a tangent about Nordic mythology or some shit before he actually explains that the reason why they all fight is to protect the Tree of Life. Isn't that just the plot of Sailor Moon R? With the absolute absurdity of the plot aside, we actually get to see some resemblance of the original Evangelion here. And by that, I mean Shinji whines about how he doesn't understand why he has to fight. Asuka roasts the fuck out of Shinji and hits him with a sick-ass burn, which puts him in his place for a bit. Kaoru goes on another philosophical tangent, and on the next page there is a nun in my Evangelion, and I don't know how to feel. Later on we find out that Ramiel is back again, but this time has another human host with boobies. Another shonen fight sequence commences, and Shinji ends up popping a cap in Ramiel's tit. The image of Shinji holding a gun is just cursed. I'm sorry, I can't get over this. After Asuka saves his ass with some help from Kaoru and Rei, Shinji ends up popping another cap into Ramiel and defeating the angel. Kaoru grabs the gobstopper Ramiel stole earlier, and Shinji goes into another completely in-character Why Do I Fight internal monologue. It is implied that there will be more angels for Shinji and crew to fight, and the volume ends there. Can someone explain to me what I just read? This one was just weird. It bears little to no resemblance to Evangelion other than the character names and their personalities. If this volume didn't have the Evangelion branding on it and just had different character names, I feel like it'd be an okay story on its own. But being a fan of Evangelion, it comes off as weird and uncomfortable to read. With the Evangelion characters, I couldn't help but laugh my ass off the entire time, especially with scenes that were intended to be more serious. If an unsuspecting normie picked this up not knowing what an Evangelion or a Shinji was, I'm pretty sure they'd be slightly intrigued to continue reading the series, but I pray to god that this isn't anyone's introduction to Evangelion. Overall, this was an okay read. There's nothing offensive here, it's not trying to spit on the name of Evangelion, but be its own thing. And quite frankly, I think it would be better if it was its own thing. You're not missing out on it if you haven't heard about it before, but if you do plan to seek this one out, I hope you don't pay any more than $10.99 on it, that's for sure. Next on the list we have Neon Genesis Evangelion Legend of the Pico Pico Middle School Students. This one was written by Yushi Kawada and was published from April 2014 to August 2018 and consists of 5 volumes. I'm sorry but this one's just fucking weird. This is Evangelion for gamers. Shinji, Asuka, Rei, and Kaoru are still chosen to be Evangelion pilots but there's a catch. They haven't built the Evangelions yet and the angels are going to attack soon. So Gendo's plan is to have all of the pilots become gamers to practice their reflexes and other skills so when they are able to pilot the Evangelion they can be prepared I guess. If you couldn't tell this is an absurd satire of the franchise. The volume starts off with everyone gaming as usual. Asuka grows tired of this and simply wants to get in the fucking robot. Finally, we found someone that Shinji can look up to. We're only a couple pages in and there is already fourth wall breaks. It's revealed that only the gamers of the highest level can pilot Avos to defeat angels. NERV is literally an acronym for National Gamers Covenant. This is a dream, right? Moving on, Masato has everyone practice playing Pac-Man with a blindfold to heighten their awareness in combat or something. Shinji is actually doing a good job playing with a blindfold on until he dies. Turns out, Gendo unplugged his controller. And when Shinji asks why Gendo did it, Gendo says there are other times he wish he pulled out. Shinji and Asuka then proceed to beat the shit out of Gendo. This is painful to witness. There is then a video game competition over a slightly altered version of Adventure Island to avoid copyright infringement. The fourth wall breaks proceed to get worse and worse of each page. Toji goes as far as to compare the Adventure Island anime to Ava and states, people don't appreciate an intelligent anime like Ava. Also, I tried to look up the Adventure Island anime and all I got was Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, which I think makes the joke funnier, honestly. This scene follows up with a what's in the box style game and I really don't want to explain what's happening in this panel. Kaoru finally shows up and proves that he's a GigaChad gamer. Toji challenges Kaoru to a takoyaki making contest to prove he is an even bigger Sigma male, and loses. Kaoru continues to ask everyone about the taste of his balls. They celebrate Kaoru's birthday for some reason, and there is a DDR slash crane game tournament arc between Hayuga and Aoba versus the pilots. Honestly, at this point in the story, the whole zany energy of the whole manga wore off on me and it just became a bland story. Rei even comments on this when she says the manga is somehow breaking new ground for having no fan service so far. Eventually an angel does attack and no one believes Masato. All of the pilots get into their plug suits while Shinji gets an actual fucking t-shirt. Asuka and Rei both manage to sprain their ankles leaving Shinji the only one to pilot the robot. Shinji is still complaining about the 100% cotton t-shirt he was issued 4 pages later. Ritsuko initially tells the pilots that the Eva is 65% complete but turns out to be 0.65% complete as Shinji has to fight the angel using only the foot of Eva Unit 0. 
Kaoru gets on the other foot to help Shinji, and Rei gets in Unit 0, which is 100% complete for comedic effect. Turns out Unit 0 can't move without its shoes, so Kaoru fucking dies. Rei attempts to defeat the Angel, but can't get past its AT field. Rei offers the Angel a cake to weaken its AT field, but the Angel ends up being disgusted by this and just leaves. This one gets a not good for me. Granted, there are parts that were genuinely hilarious, but Jesus Christ. They took one personality trait from every character and just cranked it up to 11. Shinji's extremely expressive optimism makes me want to rock his shit, which Gendo literally does. Asuka's always so bitter and says fuck so many times they have to censor it. Gendo is so creepily obsessed with Rei. Toji's accent makes him inaudible, like I am in all my videos. And Rei... Well, Ray's just chilling by the water cooler. She, she hasn't done anything wrong yet. I really wish I could do a better job at retelling this volume's plot, but it's so chaotic that it changes every two seconds. Each of the characters constantly had one-liner after one-liner that, out of context, it would be hard to explain. It's just something you have to read all the way through, which I really hope you don't. This was... one hell of a fever dream. Unless you want some out-of-context screen grabs, just check it out at your own risk. Our next victim is Neon Genesis Evangelion, the Shinji Akari Detective Diary. This one was written by Takumi Yoshimura and was published from February through November 2010. This is the shortest running manga on our list, spanning only two volumes and nine chapters. I don't know, something doesn't seem right with this one. It's giving me a weird vibe. At the start of the story, we are immediately introduced to Kaji and Masato and are told they run the Kaji Detective Agency. Cut to Shinji at school and Kensuke and Toji are in trouble. Toji tells Shinji that there is a pair of Yakuza thugs after him since they allegedly scratched their car and want the kids to pay for the repairs. I can't get over this weird stock how to draw an anime character face and seeing Evangelion characters act so animate in this moe style is just so disorienting to me. I'm not saying that Evangelion can't branch off into different art styles but I don't want to see Shinji look at me like this ever again. Anyways, they make Shinji go to the detective agency and present their case to the detectives. When Shinji gets there, he accidentally lets Pen Pen out and frantically rushes to catch him. Masato, please don't look at me with those eyes. Shinji then falls down a flight of stairs and catches Pen Pen. Afterward, Masato and Kaji congratulate Shinji on successfully bringing Pen Pen back. Shinji gets a little weird that everyone seems to know his name without him properly introducing himself yet. Shinji is then introduced to Pen Pen's assistant, Karu, and Karu agrees to help Shinji with the thugs that are threatening Toji and Kensuke. Shinji and Kaoru eventually find Toji and Kensuke getting jumped by the thugs and intervene. Kaoru proceeds to actually fight the two thugs off while Shinji gets the snot kicked out of him and hides in a corner. Eventually more thugs show up and Kaoru uses his Ava Quattro to fight them. Quattro is summoned through Kaoru's necklace kind of like a stand and defeats the rest of the thugs in one clean sweep. Wait, wait a minute. Does, does Ava have stands like stand users? Is, is that a Jojo reference? I have stand. Oh! oh! Kaoru picks Shinji back up and calls him a little bitch. And Kaji then insists that Shinji move in with them so he can work at the detective agency and help pay for the vase he broke while capturing Pen Pen. What is this, Oran Host Club or some shit? Shinji finally moves into his new place, starts complaining about the ceilings again. Some things still don't change in alternate universes, don't they, Shinji? After a questionable fourth wall break, we find out about Asuka and Rei are still classmates with Shinji. Toji and Kensuke act submissive and breedable. Kaoru finds Shinji and explains that Ava's in this universe are literally stands and hide in the stone that the user possesses, of which there are only four in the world. Kaji finds a duo and they have a meeting. Kaji tells Shinji that his science class was cancelled because the professor was scared of some ghosts that lives in the classroom. This leaves Kaoru and Shinji to investigate. They head to the science room and Kaoru blocks Shinji from getting blasted with some glass. Shinji does some hardcore bitching about how he is a normal middle schooler and doesn't want to be involved in the detective agency's antics. Turns out that Kensuke and Toji were the ghosts that was counting beakers every night and they laugh it off. Toji gives Shinji his Ava in which Shinji still refuses to summon the damn stand. Later on, we find out that Rei and Asuka were the ones who broke the window and have been spying on Kaoru and Shinji. Someone tells me it's going to take a lot more than two volumes for Shinji and Scooby to crack the case, but I digress. Kaji starts off the next chapter by talking about the road to Adam, and we cut to Baka Shinji getting in the way of Asuka and Rei, who is badly injured for no apparent reason. Kaji tells the duo that there has been some paranormal activity happening at the church and sends the two out to investigate. Shinji then complains that he never understands why he never stands up for himself, but also doesn't do anything about it, and my Evangelion once again gets evangelical. Kaoru tells Shinji that they have to extract the gem inside the statue until they are interrupted by Asuka who is also after the gem. It is revealed that Asuka and Rei work for the rival detective agency known as the GI agency and the two have their own Avas. 
Asuka sends out her Ava, which holy fuck is a hottie dami mommy, and the eye patch is a neat touch too. And the Avas, in a supposedly comical matter, refuse to fight, so they resort to a staring contest over who gets the stone. Shinji wins moving on. Shinji is walking to school the next day when a mysterious biker almost runs into him. Cut to the classroom where Toji saves Shinji from a box that almost fell on his head. When the professor opens the box, a smoke bomb erupts and the class has to evacuate. Kaji catches up with Shaggy and Scooby and tells them that the school has been receiving various death threats and Kaji believes it could be two students who recently dropped out. And thus the two set out to investigate. Shinji and Karu end up catching the motorcyclist and solve the case by pure luck and the two split up as they head home. As Shinji is walking home he continues to feel like someone is following him. When Shinji checks his bag he finds out that there is a bomb that is already counting down. In a panic Shinji summons Lelouch from Code Geass, I, I mean his Eva Uno, to get rid of the bomb. When the bomb explodes it turns out to be a harmless joke by Kaji. Shinji faints at the ridiculousness of the situation and wakes up in his bedroom where he and Karu have another wicked yaoi moment. Just as the volume concludes, we find out that Gendo is the head of the GI agency and sets Rei and Asuka out to spy on the duo again. Overall, this one just didn't make sense as to why it existed in the first place. I didn't understand why they needed to use Evangelion characters, and just like Campus Apocalypse, it probably would have benefited more if they just had completely original characters. Like Campus Apocalypse, I didn't like how they changed what the idea of the Avas were although the stand user concept was pretty fucking hilarious. At the pace the story was going so far, I have no idea how they could have wrapped this up in just another volume. I was going to seek out the second volume just for this video, but I was lucky to get my hands on this one. I mean, who knows, maybe it actually did get cancelled. I wouldn't recommend anyone seek this one out. It isn't funny like Campus Apocalypse, and it doesn't add anything significant to the Evangelion universe. It's just the definition of meh. The last volume I'm going to talk about in this video is Neon Genesis Evangelion The Shinji Akari Raising Project. That is... a title for sure. The series was written by Osamu Takahashi and was published from June 2005 until February 2016. God damn this thing has got some legs on it. However, this manga shares many of the same basic plot similarities with Angelic Days which gets confusing so let me break it down real quick. Both Angelic Days and the Shinji Akari Raising Project are based on that alternate reality from episode 26 of the original anime. Two visual novels were created based off that premise from the show, those being Girlfriend of Steel 2nd and the Shinji Akari Raising Project, both released for the PC in the early 2000s. The manga Angelic Days is directly based off the Girlfriend of Steel 2nd visual novel while the Shinji Akari Raising Project is directly based off the Shinji Akari Raising Project, or in other words, they're the same exact fucking thing and the same exact premise. Now, six pages ago in the script, I did mention that I really liked Angelic Days and recommend that everyone should check it out. So, I'm interested to see what's different in this version and if I would like it just as much. Let's check it out. The opening chapter starts off very similarly to episode 26 of the show. Asuka wakes Shinji up and calls him a sussy baka, and everyone comments about how they always argue like an old married couple. Kensuke out of nowhere just states that Shinji and Asuka are being duped because their parents are taking orders from Sele and are working on the human instrumentality project or something. Silly Kensuke, get a load of this guy. Asuka and Shinji call him an idiot and the two continue their childish banter as if nothing happened. Shinji gets left to walk home in the rain and runs into Rei, upon which he tries to make a move on her. Giga Chad Shinji is here to take your best girl. The two of them part ways and Shinji makes his way back home and to his surprise, uh oh, Rei is completely naked right in front of him. Yui then tells Shinji that Rei is a distant relative and that Rei is going to be staying with them for the foreseeable future. Hold up, this is this is the plot of a domestic girlfriend, isn't it? Moving on, Asuka acts incredibly soon to Rei and jealous that not only does Rei now live with Shinji but also sits next to him in class. Asuka accidentally tells the class that Rei and Shinji are living together in a tsundere outburst and takes her bent up frustration out on a soccer ball during Kaji's gym class. Asuka sprains her ankle in this fit of rage and Shinji has to give her a piggyback ride to the nurse's office, which is a cute moment. Risco is, yet again, the school nurse. I swear she's practically typecasted at this point. It is very clear that at this point Asuka views Rei as competition, the battle for best girl is a about to unfold before your very eyes. Further on, Yui suggests that Shinji take Rei shopping after school to get her some essentials since they're going to be living with each other for a while. Shinji obliges and they head out. Shinji and Rei have a cute shopping trip together. Rei is so much more soft and endearing in this adaptation. She is probably the most talkative she has been in any adaptation so far. It's really refreshing to see her character lead herself with such confidence. She knew what she was doing when she took Shinji to the swimsuit section, that's all I'm saying. Anyways, Asuka, Toji, Kensuke, and the class rep who have all been tailing the two blow their cover and nothing saucy ends up happening between the two. Chapter 4 is the beach episode, baby! Sigma male Shinji starts off the chapter by walking into the wrong dressing room. 
This perversion continues when Rei walks over to Shinji and all he can think about is rubbing lotion all over her. Asuka clocks Shinji with a beach ball for being weird and staring at Rei, when the beach ball pushes Shinji in between those big boobaluba bang bangs, those congo bongos, those jiggly jiggly jiros, those plumple up a dump pow pows, those succulent sucker sucks, whoopee cushion yum yum. Afterward, Shinji apologizes to Rei and Rei and Shinji go for a walk. Asuka joins to apologize as well and all is well between the three. You know what? Rei can move up on the best girl tier list now. Next chapter, we got the Summer Festival episode, baby! Shinji proposes that they show Rei around since it's her first time at a summer festival. This in turn reveals to the reader the continuous competition between Shinji and Asuka they always have at summer festivals. Shinji and Asuka are banned from some games at the festival due to their past competitive nature, and oh god, Asuka has a gun. None of the other characters can seem to calm them down, and a shonen battle scene commences between the two over various summer festival games. In the end, they win a fuck ton of games and call it a truce. Shinji leaves to go get the two snow cones as a peace offering when he hears Asuka scream in the distance. Shinji tries to be a hero and rushes over to save her, but trips on his shoelaces like Chucky Finster and passes out. When Shinji wakes up, Asuka tells him that she was just excited to hear some good news from her teachers, Ayoba and Hayuga, before Baka Shinji showed up and ruined it. Even though Shinji is a fucking idiot, Asuka's still glad that Shinji was here to quote unquote save her. She also dogs his skills as an aspiring novelist. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Fuck the cello, Shinji is an aspiring art student in this universe. Couldn't be me. It couldn't be me. Things proceed to get a little saucy when Asuka tells Shinji that she enjoys his company, and just when Asuka's about to admit she has feelings for Shinji, Shinji ruins it by staring up her fucking Yakuda. Fucking Christ. God damn it. Moving on from that disappointment, we finally get our first resemblance of Nerve. We see that Rei has been doing some sync tests with an Ava entry plug, but hasn't had a good sync ratio in a while. One page later, and we're back to our rom-com. Shinji reveals that Rei and his parents have been busy at the lab and haven't been home in the past few days. Asuka acts all tsundere and tries to make Shinji dinner when Masato, who is typecasted as a teacher yet again, picks the two of them up and takes them to the Artificial Evolution Research Center. So, there is no nerve in this universe? What is the most surprising thing is that once we get there, Gendo, who has been mostly mute this entire time, has an actual conversation with Shinji. Like, the two don't hate each other in his timeline. It's like an actual father-son relationship to an extent here. It's wild, I know. We find out that Asuka and Shinji were both brought here because Rei hasn't been sinking well in her tests and they're hoping they can calm her down emotionally. Nothing like mom and dad are fighting again can't fix. They eventually cheer Rei up and attempt another sync test which goes horribly wrong and panic ensues. They shut the test down. At the risk of losing critical data they gathered while performing the test, Gendo insists that rescuing Rei, and any life for that matter, is a top priority. Okay, I see you, good guy Gendo. Okay, go off. The only way to extract Rei is to have someone else enter another entry plug and pull Rei out, and of course, Shinji is the only one capable of doing it. Surprisingly, he doesn't complain or refuse, he just gets in the robot as instructed. Huh. Masato takes over and instructs Shinji through the process of saving Rei like a typical Masato would do, and the mission was a success. And everyone clapped. Asuka rushes over to Shinji and pretends that she doesn't care, but tells him good job on his mission anyways, and all is good in the end. Overall, I thought that manga was... Wait, wait, that was Evangelion? Well, where was the sadness, the secrecy, the, the daddy issues, the, the refusal to get in the robot? Summer festivals and beach episodes. Wait a minute, this wasn't this wasn't the Evangelion anime. This was the, this was just anime. I liked Angelic Days more. Sure, they're both basically the same thing, but Angelic Days had a bit more of a mystery to some of the characters. This this is just a slice of life of no consequences. Which is fine, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed reading it, but based off of first volumes alone, there wasn't a cliffhanger that left me seeking more. The basis of intrigue is left in the viewer wanting to seek out how the love triangle ends up at the very end, and seeing how this manga ran for longer than Angelic Days, I'm assuming they did a pretty good job at it. If you want more of an Ava slice of life, this wasn't a bad read. In fact, I should be recommending it more since it's easier to find than Angelic Days. But you'd be hard pressed to find any of these series for cheap secondhand, especially here in America. They've been out of print for a while, and because it's Evangelion, it has Evangelion tax. The Evangelion manga was weird. At the end of the day, I enjoyed taking a look at all the various Evangelion manga adaptations. Some were really amazing, and I'd highly recommend you check them out if you can get your hands on them. The official Neon Genesis Evangelion manga is still available in places like Barnes & Noble and Write Stuff, and digitally through Bookwalker. Others went buck wild and made sure Shinji was strapped at all times. Most of them are a product of their time, and it's probably best if they stayed there. Although it was refreshing to see some of the different interpretations of some of my favorite characters of all time. 
They weren't the best literary pieces I've ever read, but they were still fun to experience regardless. I've seen these characters suffer so much in their source material, it was refreshing to see them go to a school festival or experience some teenage romance between best girl and worst girl. I got suckered into reading doujinshis, didn't I? 